Well, hello and welcome to Surviving Savage Snake and Spider Bite webinar that we're hosting today. Um, in case we haven't met, my name is Holly Foxworth. I'm a registered nurse and I am the marketing manager for content here at Axiom. You gotta love a Windows hello whenever you get it. You can give you a reminder there. Uh, we also have Dr. Scott Cherry. He's our chief medical officer. Fair share of uh, snake and spider bite. So I will let him introduce himself shortly. Before we get started, um, at the top of your screen there on the right, you'll notice that we have another webinar that's gonna be coming up on the 11th. And I'm really excited about this one. If you've spent any time on social media, any of the social media platforms, or even Dr. Google, I'm sure you've heard the term ADHD for adults. Um, I think that they've decided that, that we all have that. So whether we do or we don't, we're gonna go through the seven signs of how it is that you would recognize that and how you can effectively manage that in the workplace. So I think that, that is gonna be a great, great event. We'll have some great content, some great takeaways that um, can kind of provide some clarity on whether you follow that category or maybe one of your employees falls in that category and how it is that you could shift some of those routines there so that'll be coming up on the 11th. It'll be at one o'clock PM. All you have to do there is just press that registration button. Again, you don't have to, to add any additional information. Just press the button. It'll automatically get you registered and send you that confirmation email. Um, right below that, you'll see that we have the question and answer box. As always, we like, we're a chatterbox ourselves. We like to talk, but we also like to talk with you. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you wanna share or ask at any point during, during the event, please feel free to type that there in the question and answer box. And we will, we usually try to get to them within the event. If not, we can um, wrap it up at the end, but I'm gonna go ahead and extend it out again that today, whoever has the best question, we'll start this up again. Whoever has the best question, we will award um, a prize. And so we will notify you of that. So I wanna hear what you have to say. If you have any great snake and spider stories, I wanna hear all about them. And then lastly, at the bottom, you'll see that that's where the resource section is located. Um, we do have a copy of the presentation deck today. We also have a blog post in there that are do's and don'ts for um, first aid management of snake bites, um, as long as, as well as the information for white papers um, that includes the one on heat, especially since it's so hot right now everywhere, and also Tempo Live. So if you have any additional questions, we're happy to help you with that one. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Cherry to let us to introduce himself, and then we'll get started. Dr. Cherry, uh, good afternoon. Tell us Thanks how amazing you are. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> um, well, um, again, my name is Scott Cherry. I'm Axiom's chief medical officer. I um, my professional background is I'm board certified in preventive medicine, public health, and occupational environmental medicine. And I've been supporting um, the military, government, and uh, corporate industrial operations for the past uh, almost 20 years now. Um, specific to this topic, I was um, a Navy corpsman or medic for about four year for four years, um, active duty, and then nine years as a Army physician. So I actually have a fair amount of um, wilderness medicine and uh, medical um, uh, provisions and austere settings. So. It's, it's very fun to, in some ways, revisit this type of topic. Uh, so uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, we are tickled that you are here. Um, I personally run away whenever the, the idea of snakes and spiders makes me a little nervous. So I'm thrilled to death that, that any time that we can talk about what it is that we can do to avoid seeing them or being bitten by them, that is always a positive in my book. So just to kind of give you an idea of what we're gonna go through today, we'll go through what it is on the venomous snake and spider bite risk. So we're gonna talk through some numbers there. We'll go through how it is that you can identify which ones are the most common venomous snakes and spiders. We'll do what to do, what uh, steps you need to take if you're bitten, when and where it is that you would wanna seek treatment, some dangerous myths that you definitely want to avoid, and then also best practices for preventing exposure. So, Dr. Sherry, I'll just kind of get you started here. Um, I was pulling stats yesterday, and, and there wasn't as much for 
for spider bites. They had explained on the um, on the NIOSH, NIOSH website that those aren't tracked as well. However, they do have some pretty good data for the snake bites. So talk us through some of these some of these stats and and kind of what some of those outcomes look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you, you know, fortunately, these bites are rare. So, you know, 8,000 a year. So if you if you think about, you know, 350 million people in the uh, U.S., and then if you calculate, you know, every day also, there's that many people. It's called person years. Kind of that denominator when you divide into the seven or 8,000 bites are rare. Um and then fortunately, fatality is very rare across those 8,000 bites. So that's really great. And that's different when you go outside the U.S. Uh, to Africa and to the Middle East, where you have uh, cobras and things like that, that have very, very lethal neurotoxins that I think we see it in the movies often where it's like you're bitten and then you have, you know, 30 seconds uh, to live or you cut your arm off within, uh, a, I don't know if that's actually valid by the way, but, uh, cause I know our, our circulation is pretty quick, but, you know, just refocusing back to the U S fortunately it's rare and severity is, is quite rare. Um, um, you know, however, if you do get a snake bite and don't seek medical treatment, that is where the fatality risk comes in. And we'll kind of re re uh, emphasize that later on as well. Um, but additionally, like for, you know, for our um, audience, workers may have lasting injuries and disability because um, in some ways, you know, even minor snake bites could can turn major. And then when it comes to um, the spider bites, um, which are usually less severe across the board because of comorbidities, health status. Uh, things along those lines, uh, a simple um, spider bite can become highly infected. And there's some other things we'll talk about through. So um, probably I'll say it here and then say it again. But fortunately, in this setting, I think it's always good to get um, a medical consultation um, uh, with a spider bite. A lot of people at home probably will not get that done unless they really know the type of spider for all snake bites, you really should go to the ER uh, or call 911, and so consider that like a medical emergency. But I'll cut, we'll keep uh, visiting that. But you know, uh, you made that quick comment before we started about um, you know you run the other direction, and um, as I was revisiting the epidemiology on this topic, you know, usually people are bitten at least by snakes um, in the lower extremity except for men, and they say a lot of times they're struck in the upper extremity, and they didn't really explain why, but I think you explained why um, most, and I don't know if this is true, true, but just just knowing sometimes some anecdotes, you know, women are running away from snakes, and men are kind of curious about snakes, and so they're usually reaching down to either play with them or deal with them, and so um, I think your, your um, strategy is probably the most uh, protective <laughs> i'll take that as a win i'll take it as yeah. a win then uh, we did have some some uh, questions that had came in already um a lot about asking will we have a recording of this yes absolutely if you have people that were not able to attend we will have a recording and go out after this event and so you can you're you're more than welcome to share that with them um also let's see we had a funny story that that Angela wanted to share. Um, let's see, where was that one? She was explaining that uh, um, several years ago, there were middle school kids that, that she came home. They saw a plastic spider on the garage door, and she had to tell them they couldn't scare her. She worked towards it. She pulled it off. She it jumped right over her head and ran down the driveway, and she screamed so loud. Oh, man, I can't even imagine. Yeah, mm. that would definitely give me the willies as well, as a for sure. All right. So let's talk about the the venomous hallias that, that you would recognize some of the, the four most common. And these aren't by no means the the only ones that are dangerous, but they mm -hmm. are four of the most common for, for here, especially in, in the U.S. So talk us through these then. Yeah, so fortunately, again, in the U.S., we have kind of these are the, the known culprits. Um, they're all called pit vipers. Um, and uh, throughout the U.S., they're um, 
some are more found in some parts of the uh, country than others. So, for instance, rattlesnakes are more found kind of in the western United States. Um, copperheads actually are about 50% of all snake bites, and they are in the uh, eastern United States. And um, cotton mouse or water moccasins are also kind of in the southeast um, United States. And, you know, I think in many ways, it's good to kind of get a sense of what these snakes look like. But the big picture really is, is it doesn't matter in many ways what they look like. Your expertise, unless you're dealing with this daily or, or very frequently, you're going to be most likely wrong, especially in emergency settings. And so, again, I want to um, encourage the group to defer on the side of um, conservative approach and, and really seeking a medical consultation um, with a snake bite. But um, I remember always um, throughout my whole childhood and adult life, um, the wisdom of adults trying to say, okay, this is what this snake looks like. This is what this snake looks like. And it, it kind of gives you some reassurance potentially, but um, I think you can easily be mistaken as well. Um, what's interesting with these uh, pit vipers, they're called pit vipers because they actually have these ports at the back of their heads that uh, detect, um, uh, I believe it's infrared, it might have escaped me just that in, in this moment, but I, I'm pretty sure it's infrared uh, sense. So it can actually strike out to heat uh, sense or to heat radiating um, uh, prey or even us. And so that's where they get the name uh, Pit Viper across the board. Um, what's interesting too is just broadly, Venomous snakes, it's essentially they're injecting a toxin into you. A toxin is a, a, a chemical substance that's going to disrupt your biological functions. And they're broadly categorized into blood disrupting and um, a neurologically disrupting uh, toxins. So uh, a hematoxin or a neurotoxin. Uh, fortunately, most of these snakes are hematoxin only. It's those um, uh, snakes that I mentioned in the, the Middle East and Africa that are more neurotoxic. Um, but some of the snakes, like the rattlesnake, does have um, some neurotoxins as well. But essentially, you're going to get a manifestation of a, a bunch of local tissue damage as well as um, more systemic uh, symptoms from that uh, hemotoxin and neurotoxins there. Yeah, definitely. And so it does look like that there's some common characteristics then yeah. of those vipers. So do you want to kind of go through what those would be? Sure. You know, and so the um, there'll be thin black vertical pupils uh, like a cat's eye um, and then the triangular shaped uh, heads with holes behind the eyes to detect prey. And so that, those are those um, pits that I was talking about. Um, and they usually have thick bodies and heads with a neck that narrows at the uh, base of the skull. And then um, their fangs are hollow that rotate forward. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it seemed like we had, a, I saw a question that was asking about uh, recognizing um, the difference between something about a rattler. I'll look for that as we keep keep moving, but I definitely saw your question and we'll make it back to it. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so talk to us then about, about the two most common venomous spiders that, that, that we may see. Sure, and, and so here again, it's it's nice to have just kind of a kind of a narrowing of, of two specific species, the brown recluse and the black widow. Um, I've always heard of the black window has the uh, hourglass shape um, on its body, and you can see that there. Um, and so, you know, spider bites are, are probably a notch down from the snake bites in many ways. Um, but there are a couple of things with both of these that you should be really paying attention to. Um, you know, brown recluse do uh, secrete a venom that... Um, you know, for larger larger animals or, or uh, you know, humans, it, they're less of an issue. But I have seen cases where um, someone's bitten and then um, that toxin is released into kind of a compartment in the body, like, uh, say, the front lower leg uh, where your tibia is at, your shin bone. And um, sadly, I, I saw that ruin the career of a Marine who essentially was bedridden and then just had had num a numerous amounts of surgery to release the pressure in that compartment. 
And so, again, you really want to be fairly aggressive um, with with brown recluse bites. Um, they can be um, fairly disabling, although it's rare. Um, but it really was a you know a young marine recruit at, at boot camp that you know had this and. Um, I think he was, pers- you know, when you're in boot camp, you're pushed to your limits. And so I think he wasn't even sure if he had a spider bite and then, you know, he's pushing through it. And then by the time they realized this is something more urgent, you know, the things had kind of manifested pretty far along the ways. And then interesting with the Black Widow mm-hmm. is um, it's it's one of the common reasons for a false referral to a surgeon Um the venom of a black widow can cause um, very rigid abdomen or, or rigid stomach area. And so that is usually a ve- um, an urgent surgical referral in, from the ER. And for some reason, the way the black widow's toxin can um, affect um, our bodies, it mimics a surgical abdomen. And so um, I know the general surgeons are pretty good about looking for that as well, but Um, I'm not sure. I'm not a surgeon, but I'm not sure how they really, you know, do they still not go in and do surgery in case uh, if there is a a spider bite or not. But um, again, these are are lower in general severity than the um, snake bites. But again, for our audience, I think uh, getting um, some medical consultation is really key. Um, especially with comorbidities now, um, if someone is uh, diabetic or has some metabolic um, disruption, um, in they or even circulatory, they are much higher risk for a, a, a subsequent infection, a skin infection, or even deeper tissue infection. And so, if it ends up becoming a workers' comp claim, uh, that claim would end up covering the the sequela or the 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 additional issues that arise from this spider bite. And so, um, you know, I think now we're looking just population health wise, um, maybe nine to 10% of the population is diabetic and maybe 30 to 40% is pre-diabetic. So even the pre-diabetics will have some form of uh, immune and circulatory uh, dysregulation. So um, again, I think, and I think it's one of the most common workers' comp claims. I did some research when I was going through my training as a resident in preventive medicine, and actually um, insect bites are one of the most common uh, workers' comp claims in the federal system, and so I would suspect that pushes along uh, into um, non-federal work as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, Doug, Douglas asking, could you discuss a little bit more the various color variations that are found in both both the black widows and snakes? So you're going to call out some of my limitations. I'm actually um, colorblind. So in in some ways, I actually do not um, rely on that heavily. Um, So I don't know if if Holly, if you have anything you can kind of point to us uh, for that question or if we can get back to that person. I can yeah I think we have some um, I think we have some infographics and so Douglas I'll send that to you after we um, after we wrap up your day mm-hmm. that way that you can have it for reference so good deal okay so let's talk about what to do then if you do if you are bitten um, what what's your next move sure you know and um, aside from what's listed here I would say because um, we've already reviewed that um, most snake bites are one they're rare but Um, you know, fatality is rare, and especially with um, spider bites, too, being uh, less severe. Um, Everyone is going to kind of, the tendency is to get alarmed and freak out, and and you definitely don't want to do that with a snake bite, because the more upset and the more um, charged you get, your heart rate's going to raise up and actually kind of spread the toxin faster. So I would say um, the first thing you want to do is to try and stay calm. And that's uh, channeling Dr. Curte. Uh, I think you should always stay calm in any in any event. But uh, I have not mastered that, uh, sadly, in day to day activities. But um, uh, but still, I think it's it's specifically pertinent here with um, uh, snake and insect bites. So um, but, yeah, you do want to try to get a sense of identifying the snake and spider if you can do it safely you hear of some people killing the snake, but, um, you know, that's very probably situation dependent, 
but maybe now with phones on us everywhere, if you can get a picture, that will help your color vision um, ER doc uh, or even the um, poison control center who are experts in this to, it really does give a lot of insight into the medical evaluation component of it. Um, and like with any injury, you wanna wash the area with soap and water uh, very well. That makes a huge difference with um, any injury, um, even like needle sticks. Um, it's one of the most simplest things. And I, I love it because here at Axum, we, we really are experts in conservative management of so many different injuries and illnesses. And I think this is a bedrock and a lot of people forget to do it. And so um, it also helps really prevent that secondary infection as well. Um, and just like staying calm um, from a cardiovascular system, you want to just really try to relax and keep um, that area um, immobilized as well, because it'll, it'll prevent as much blood flow as possible to that area. Um, and secondary to that, elevating the limb to the level of the heart will help kind of normalize the, 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 the blood pressure to that area. Obviously, we have higher blood pressure, a venous blood pressure in our lower legs, so um, and then, again, with, um, with these bites, even if they seem minor um, within the first um, few minutes or even hours, you never know what could happen, you know, hours down the road. Um, and so you do want to remove anything that be con uh, constricted. Um, we do see things where rings have to be cut off if the, if the hand swells too much and it starts occluding the circulation and things like that. Yes, definitely. All right, let's go through when and where to seek treatment. Um, and then, because I think that many of these questions, I am really surprised at, at the number of questions that came in here. These are really good. So I think that they, they may answer some of these um, as we okay. go through it. And then we'll talk about the others as, as we uh, make our way back through. So talk us then to this issue comes up a lot and we get a lot of calls every single year about what it is, you know, what what facilities stock antivenom and, and you mm -hmm. know, where do we need to send people? So talk us through what, what the differences would be there for both snake bites and also spider bites. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this is actually a main point of reinforcement for the webinar I want everyone to take away. And so for snake bites, again, you do want to seek emergency care, um, calling 911, um, and maybe even going, um, if you have the ability to drive to your nearest emergency department, um, you know, that's key. You know, a service like ours, we actually advise our clients to call 911, but then also call us and um, a lot of our what our service does when we are referring someone to a fixed facility or an urgent care or a emergency room or an occupational medicine clinic is we make sure that they have the appropriate level of um, resources to take care of that injury. Usually it's eye, hand, uh, things like that. But um, this may also be a case where, um, you know, helping to make sure that that emergency room um, has the appropriate um, uh, anti-venom potentially. Um, and so again, the ER will actually usually, um, unless they're just, it's an area that gets lots of snake bites and the physicians are just dealing with it very frequently, they will usually reach out to a poison control specialist um, to determine if antivenom is needed. You know, antivenom is not a benign treatment. It, it has a lot of side effects. And so you really want to give it when there's a, a true risk benefit. And I think with COVID now, I think people are much more nuanced about risk benefit discussions, at least. Um, but this is a clear case of really needing to determine if you need antivenom or not. Um, and so, again, you want to deal with this um, we advise all of our clients for any injury to call as soon as possible. The longer you wait, usually it never helps. It only hurts the outcomes to the employee and to the organization. And so really the best outcomes, even if it's a severe injury, um, will result with a, a quick um, uh, reporting and then a quick um, medical treatment. And so symptoms can develop quickly. So you, you do wanna make sure um, uh, 
if, 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 if the symptoms do become severe quickly, getting medical care will make a huge difference. Um, but the flip side, a lot of snake bites sometimes um, take eight, up to eight or 12 hours to develop those symptoms. So when you do go to the emergency room, they probably will observe you for eight or 12 hours just to make sure that um, you're stable and nothing um, uh, nothing happens. And so l the last bullet point here is um, there's about a 25% chance of a, a dry bite, which means a venomous snake that does not inject um, their toxic um, or their venom, or you just have a non-venomous snake, um, but you still have this risk of infection that we spoke about earlier with, um, even if you have no chronic medical conditions, um, you still can get um, uh, this secondary infection. And so really the, the take home for snake bites is quite easy. It's really to go to the emergency room. Um, you know, with spider bites, again, for I think this population, our audience, it's easy still to get like a medical consultation with a service like ours that can quickly uh, guide you in the acute moment and then with case management. Um, but again, just kind of talking through some technical details, um, you know, a, a brown, a mild brown recluse bite will have kind of this local rash and irritation, but you will get still some systemic body aches and pains because that's just what um, venom does. And um, with severe brown recluse bites, you're going to have a, a much higher level of venom released into the body. So you'll actually feel sick. You'll have just like flu, fever, chills, and you may actually have some tissue damage to the point where you see blood in your urine. Um, and then in very rare cases, you can have this compartment syndrome, which can be a surgical issue. And um, again, the one case that stands out to me from over a decade ago um, was really, really severe. And this was in a very healthy person otherwise, so, and young, you know, so, um, you know, so with black widow bites, um, those are, are less severe than the brown recluse. Um, and so you're going to, again, going to have that local um, uh, swelling. But again, what's very interesting is, is the abdominal cramps and muscle spasms in the, uh, in the, the midsection, which can potentially mimic a surgical um, need. And so um, that's something also that should be evaluated. Um, yeah, so really, you know, you kind of have this tiered approach where snake bites are the most concerning, brown recluse bites are, are next in line, and then black widow or third. Awesome. And then so Ty, this is really the part where I think it is most important because there are so many myths that occur, um, things that we see on TV or things that, you know, old wives tells that we've heard from different ways, um, from different um, places of content. So talk us through then what those, what some of those myths are and not just what they are, but why it is that they're dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think um, along the lines of, um, what we see in the movies with the neuro uh, toxic snakes. Um, we see a lot of people putting tourniquets on in the movies. And, and so I think it just assimilates into our culture. Um, but this is really something you do not want to do. Um, it, in, in some ways it makes sense because you're trying to prevent blood flow, but the opposite happens. And you do want your body to respond in many ways. Our immune systems are, are quite sophisticated and um, you do want blood flow to a degree. Um, the other thing that can happen is, is a tourniquet to be actually very effective has to be incredibly tight. And so um, if you have it on uh, as tight as you think you need it to, to stop blood flow, um, what will happen also is if the area starts to swell, then you're actually going to have um, an even tighter tourniquet and you literally are killing the, t the, that extremity or those tissues. Um, you know, in surgeries, they'll apply, um, surgical tour tourniquets, but they'll have to release them at times. And it's a very sophisticated approach. And so really there's nothing good that comes from using a tourniquet, um, around a wound. Um, and then similarly applying ice and heat, it does change how the body reacts to, uh, the bite. And, and so it's changing, you know, ice will constrict the area 
and um, slow down blood flow to the area, and then heat will speed it up. And so you really just don't want to – you want to allow your body to, to do its thing until you get professional medical help. Um, and then I think this is also a big part of movies where I've – I can't remember the movies now. It's been so long, but I do remember – people uh, trying to suck the venom out of um, a wound. And, and so really the, the fangs are going deep enough into the body that you're really not going to be able to do anything adequately. And then if you actually make your own incision to try and cut, you're just adding to the, the trauma there. So, um, you know, this, this fourth one is, is quite kind of interesting um, so, yeah, you don't want to micromanage the emergency system in your area. You, you know, if you really don't have access to 911, um, an ambulance, really just going to your, your closest emergency department is um, uh, is best because they have a system in place to where they are the professionals in the logistics of delivering the anti-venom. And so... Um, you don't want to waste time getting other medical treatment just in pursuit of, um, you know, if you have an emergency department an hour away, you don't want to drive three hours to the bigger ER. And maybe the smaller department actually has it because they have the more frequent um, bites and things like that. So, um, and then lastly, I think it, it makes sense, but you never know, right? It's, it's don't bring a live snake um, to the emergency department. That would really, uh, I think, uh, from a safety perspective, um, freak everyone out. So, yeah. And then, so just to kind of revisit that that piece about the do not bypass your closest emergency department um, because those are stored in because the antivenom is stored in separate locations. That is because of the short half life and the expiration of the of that type of, of medication. Correct. And that's the reason why it's not um, cool. kept by a facility. Correct. Yeah. You know, and maybe some tertiary medical centers may have it, but only probably in areas that are just really hit hard. But otherwise, they are um, kind of they may not even be at any hospital. It may be just um, kind of similar to our, emer our federal emergency supply system. Uh, yeah. So you just don't want to micromanage it because you, you really are just wasting. Uh, you may not be getting the, the bang for your buck that you're thinking uh, that you think you're getting by driving to the larger emergency department. Yeah. Hey, before we move on to best practices for how it is that you can prevent exposure, I'm seeing some questions here that are really good about what if you were located, you know, what if you don't have cell service to call 911? Or what if you're located 70 miles away? I think that, that Gordon had put on there, who's from the National mm -hmm. Park Service, he works at Death Valley National Park, the nearest mm -hmm. hospital and medical facility is 70 miles away. Any advice for first aid treatment to care for a person while um, transporting them after a bite? And he was saying, Let's see. It recommends that we should have in our emergency kits to be better prepared. What should they have in their kits to be better prepared mm -hmm. for snake spider bites? So in that type of scenario, what what would you recommend? You know, so there, there's probably it's probably worth if you're there frequently or always in that area, uh, do some homework to see uh, which snakes are there, um, how how frequent are the bites? Like out of the eight thousand that are happening in the U.S are only a few happening where you're at or, or the majority of them happening? Cause that will give you some indication of relative risk. Um, and then also reach out to the, 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 the closest hospital to see if they have a recommendation or if there's a facility, maybe like an urgent care or a, a clinic that may actually be um, kind of prepped to help out. It sounds like that area is fairly isolated. And so we, we don't recommend in general to go to not an, you know, to a facility that's um, not considered an emergency department in general. But, you know, if you are in, in, ver in, in an area that's quite isolated and that has high risk for um, snake bites, there may be facilities or maybe even um, the park rangers or something like that may actually have anti-venom. And so, you know, this guidance is usually, um, um, more specific to kind of general um, uh, company uh, operations. But um, I think this is a good question. And 
you can also think about having a um, a snake bite kit if you if you don't. Um, but I think for in general, it would just contain mostly general first aid unless again you have specific guidance from that area. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, and the other was, there were several questions that were asking about um, either difference in the amount of the venom that a young snake would inject versus an adult snake. Can you repeat that, Holly? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's questions about that if you have a, maybe like a baby snake versus mm -hmm. an adult snake, is there a difference in the amount of venom that would be released if, if um, mm. once the fangs are inserted and the venom goes in? You know, you know, anecdotally, I've heard that the the younger snakes usually are not as wise or as able to control their venom. And so they actually, you know, a, a younger snake will actually give a higher dose. I'm, I'm not sure if that's kind of um, evidence-based or not, but um, mm. I wouldn't use the size of the snake also to kind of be a... Um, like, I think it's an interesting discussion point, but I, I wouldn't use the size of the snake also to change your course of action. Yeah, good point. And then um, also, uh, Kaylin was asking, are the recommendations that we've given for snakes and spiders, would, it, would those also be similar for uh, scorpion stings? Yes. Um, you know, the, those are kind of fallen between the snake and the spider bite. There can be some quite poisonous um, um, scorpions. So just doing homework on where you're at and if the um, uh, what, what's kind of the, the mix of, of venomous to non-venomous scorpions in that area. So just, the, you know, would you go to the ER for every scorpion bite? It just depends on the area you're in. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's talk through some best practices then on preventing, and then we'll wrap it up with, with some of the additional questions because there's still a lot here to, to ask. Um, so in terms of how it is that you would prevent exposure, um, we talked about it in the very beginning about, you know, I, I run away. <laughs> I'm a runner. If I see it, I'm going the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not on the one on the front lines there to be fighting with snakes. Uh, but talk us through what it is that where some of these things happen because they seem to be very common places that, that are commonly overlooked um, when we're not mm -hmm. expecting them. Yeah, so the, the first one here is kind of the classic, you know, you have some wood um, in the back of a building or in the side of a corner of a place that hasn't been really disrupted for months or years, and then now it's time to mess with it, and you just, you just dive in um, kind of like a sneak attack, like nothing's going on, and you just start grabbing wood, um, you know, that can be really a high risk um, uh, occurrence. And so I always try to make a lot of noise and maybe even some just, uh, you know, test the area with some uh, like with a stick or things like that. Um, when um, if you're camping or if you're kind of in a new area where um, you're you're sleeping overnight, um, a classic is. Um, and I actually think this is probably more for scorpions than spiders or snakes, but um, leaving your shoes out, you know, a lot of times uh, a creature will kind of crawl into your shoe because it's a nice little temporary home for them. And so you always want to check your shoes um, if you've left them out, even during the day. Um, and I think some really uh, the most wisest uh, campers or those just out in the wilderness, they'll have mechanisms to keep their shoes um, inaccessible to kind of wildlife. Um, but really anything that is stored, you want to kind of, um, you know, if you can wear gloves, that that's like a layer of, of pretty good protection for most, um, for most insects and, and potentially snakes too. Um, but you want to, uh, carefully inspect stored items. And then, uh, you know, if it's an area that really has not been, um, you know, groomed or if there's tall grass and just areas that have not been um, uh, disturbed in quite a while, like that's going to be kind of a huge um, 
a huge area of, of risk for um, spiders and snakes. And so you really just, um, you need to be careful when you're disrupting things that have just been sitting for quite a while. Um, you know, a lot of times our uniform was considered a, a personal protective equipment with our boots and, um, uh, you know, long pants and long sleeves and things like that. And I think you see a lot of people working outside. Um, they use that for sun protection, even though it may be hotter in some ways, but it also will protect you against insect bites and um, snake bites, things like that. Um, uh, and the last bullet point here is kind of the the holly clause, where if you, um, if you see something, you really want to, you don't want to go towards it. You want to go away from it. Um, and then I think in areas, I think especially for that one question, it'd be interesting if that, that employee or that person, um, if they work by themselves or if they work um, with a, a partner, because really having kind of the buddy system is, is really important for, for isolated events. I know we would, um, when you see people working in, um, in vessels or uh, close, um, cl very um, tight spaces, usually they have a, a someone watching, making sure that, you know, the oxygen levels haven't changed or uh, some type of uh, toxic exposure hasn't changed. So this is also good for isolated areas um, in the wilderness. Sounds good. Um, let's get to some of the questions because there's some really good ones that are on here. And I also, one thing we didn't cover, but but it's a good point that um, I believe I believe you pronounce it Avery, and I apologize if I, I mispronounced that, but she was about your pets. Uh, she was asking about, she uh, said so that her puppy had been bitten by a rattlesnake while they were on a hike, and so she was asking about uh, what it is, she's okay now, and they were able to take care of it, but what, what would be the best practice there on how it is that you should manage that mm -hmm. if you have an animal that is bitten as well? Yeah, especially with snake bites, I would really, um, really use kind of the same human guidance, um, except instead of an emergency room, you really could go to your local vet. Um, and I actually think for um, for pets, there's actually uh, some vaccines for uh, snake bites, um, which when I when I came across, I'm a, a dog owner myself. When I came across that when I was living in West Texas or maybe it was Southern New Mexico at one point, I saw a sign advertising for um, uh, uh, snake venom uh, vaccine for pets. Um, I thought, oh, it's a shame humans can't get that. And, and maybe there is that for certain workers, but um, I, I, I would, if you're in an area that's high risk for your pet, uh, visit your vet to see if there's a vaccine that could um, really help protect them. But uh, in short of that, I would um, really just seek uh, veterinary care, especially with a, a snake bite. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's see. Let's go to some other ones. There were some questions about what poisonous snakes are indigenous, are indigenous to the Atlanta area. Um, I What we can do is pull some information. And actually, I'll just send that to you directly um, since we have so many today. Best practices, let's see. Um, Michael was asking, what is the best practice when you cannot find the species that has bitten you? And my worry is tracking down the biter in the brush, or as mentioned, you wake up, you wake up with a bite in case of a spider. So if you don't know what has bitten you, then how does that change? Does that change anything that we do? So I think in general, if you don't have good a good sense of what has bitten you, then you defer to kind of the the what what's could be most severe. And so uh, being observed in the emergency room, they can really closely uh, track your symptoms. And if they start seeing a certain um, manifestation of different symptoms occurring, if if you're starting to have flu like symptoms, if you're getting that rigid abdomen, if you're getting some neurological symptoms, then they can pretty quickly um, ascertain if it was a venomous um, bite or not. And then what's nice is a lot of the anti-venoms are cross-reactive. Uh, and so it's not like there's uh, one anti-venom for, for each specific snake. And so 
Um, I would really defer to um, getting, uh, again, going to the emergency room, especially if you see puncture, puncture marks. Puncture marks, yeah. Um, let's see, Lawrence was asking us um, about how to tell the difference between, sorry, my uh, how to tell the difference between rattlesnake and bull snake markings other than rattles. Do you have um, any specific information on that or we, we could pull some? Yeah, I, I think um, the rattle is obviously the, the, the most clear one. I, I don't have a great um, kind of uh, rule of thumb. Otherwise, um, I, I would really defer to getting getting seen um, and, and being watched because th there are studies um, that have looked at um, like recall of um, what you thought you were bit from and what ended up happening. And so um, I, I do think there is a danger in over emphasizing your skills on being able to determine if you, if you, you can identify that type of snake, you know. Good point, good point. Uh, there's a question about, uh, let's see, bull snakes. I'm not familiar with bull snakes. You may have more, more knowledge about that, mm -hmm. but um, Sheldon was saying, I spend a lot of time on, on the lake and there are bull snakes that can reach six to eight feet long. I don't believe they're venomous, but I could be mistaken. If I was bit by a bull snake, what should we do? So would you just defer to the same, same guidelines and recommendations mm -hmm. as, as the others as well? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Um, ooh, here's a good one. Um, from Alan, and so Alan was saying hi, just sharing. He'd explain to your children about snakes in your area due to when he was younger, he had a baby copperhead mixed up with worms until the father rushed over to stop me from playing with them. So that's a really good point about the the importance of educating educating kids. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Cherry? Well, so the, you know, children or, or s smaller individuals are more susceptible, right, to, to a, a, um, a venomous bite because relative to the amount of venom being um, injected, um, a smaller body is essentially going to be more overwhelmed more quickly. So, um, and they, if it's a real small child or if it's someone crawling, if, you know, it, Snake bites are usually on the lower extremity, but the higher they are up to the face or to the heart, the more concerning it is as well. Um, and so the problem is, is if, if you have a venomous bite in the face, it it's gonna swell the local area, but if your local area that was bit is near your airway, that's extremely concerning. Or if the venom is getting close to your eyes or your you know specific organs, it's very concerning. So. Um, you know, the ER will be more quickly to give an anti-venom as well, based on just the area and uh, kind of the epidemiologic uh, risk of which snake is there. Absolutely. Um, let's see, Dion was saying, and, and this brings up another good point. Um, he was talking about South America, but and he's a safety officer, but he was talking about um, that they've noticed that the pharmacy have snake bite kits that are sold um, being sold and we're asking about how effective they would be. And that kind of ties into some of the discussion that we've had in prior events about these extraction devices. And so there's some really varied opinions on mm -hmm. whether whether or not those should be used or whether they should not be used. Um, you know, I've heard both ways. What's, what's your thoughts there? I would actually, I, th I think I'll put that as a to-do for me and just see if there's any good evidence for kind of uh, self um, self administered um, snake bite kits. So um, let me list that as a uh, some homework for me because I am actually interested in that. Because based on that yeah. other person's um, that other person's question, I, I don't know if they're available in the U.S. or not. Um, but that's definitely something for me to kind of um, read up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll follow up. Okay, let's see, anything, ooh, here's another good one. Um, anything out there to deter snakes from being around your house? 
And then it probably doesn't so I'm, put I'm, it <laughs> not within your doctor scope. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not an expert, but I do know the 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 good uh, landscaping. Like if you have tall grass, like that definitely invites all kinds of critters for safe haven and then predators to go after them. That that's probably the only thing I would know. Um, probably some there's probably some people at Axiom that know way more than me about this. Um, or Holly, you may know, but um, but the, I would say definitely the the well don't don't allow the grass to to or other um, or the the same thing with if you can prevent kind of a buildup of um, stacking wood unless it's you, you know like sometimes I get bad about letting some things on my patio kind of stack up, but if you can have as things as groomed as possible, I know that's very helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, we live at the lake and and um, mm. so we have had so many snakes um, this year. It's almost like I, I refuse to go outside when the when it's dark if there's not a light that's on to, to be able to see because there's just been so many this year um, mm. right here on the lake. Yeah. So definitely keep a keep an eye out for what may be going on. Um, Michael had mentioned um, that the Boy Scouts had taught him for coral snakes um, that red on black. And then friendly Jack, red on yellow, yeah. killed a fellow. Oh, I love that. No, I love that. That's a, I've that's heard a- of that. I've just never memorized it. And um, no, that's really great for him to share. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Michael. That's excellent. Um, let's see. We have people are calling. Um, oh, Alice is asking. Have you ever heard of a brown widow? Do you have any information on them? So just like it seems like this year or the last couple of years with COVID and then now monkeypox kind of um, evolving, (laughs) there is now a new species. um, I think it's non-native to the U.S., but now there's this brown widow that... um, it, it, it does seem to be more venomous than the traditional black widow. So um, maybe consider it more like a brown recluse from a, a concerning perspective. And, um, you know, so like, again, I, I said, I don't really differentiate from a color perspective, but um, my color vision is probably okay. But yeah, I'm definitely more concerned about being bitten by a brown spider here in the, in the U S for, specifically for brown recluse, but it does look like there is some, there is this kind of new species of brown widow that's come in. So it's, uh, wow. life is continuing to change and be uh, challenging at times. <laughs> Never a dull moment. Absolutely. Uh, Linda was told us about that, that um, her, her dog was bitten by a snake and thank goodness he's okay. But the vet bill, the vet is $3,000 richer. Oh, Linda, I, I understand completely. Um, Let's see. We've talked about the spiders. Let's see. Average size. Um, Amanda was asking, um, do you know what the average size of these types of spiders are? Like the leg span of a nickel. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't know what would be the average size. I mean, I I can probably just give anecdotes of what I've seen, but it's probably... Um, yeah, the size of a nickel to quarter, a lot mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then let's see, Danielle was asking, um, is the necrosis always compartmentalized or can it become systemic if untreated? What was the first part, Holly? Is the necrosis always compartmentalized or can it become systemic if it's untreated? Is this for a snake or a spider? Well, or, I guess it could be for either. I would assume it would be yeah. for, for spider, but, you know, when you have the yeah. necrosis for the wrong ground or clues. Yeah. Yeah. So the definitely the, um, you know, the necrosis is like dying uh, tissue. Um, and, it, yeah, it, it's definitely localized, but it can go systemic. And that was the issue with this one person with the compartment syndrome. But definitely with the snake bites, um, uh, the, the – um, the, the hematoxin will de- will definitely disrupt um, your, your blood and the blood vessels and, and surrounding tissues, and it can travel. So, yeah, you're going to have – it may not be to the level of necrosis because usually necrosis means black, like 
um, it, it'll have black, like almost burnt tissue, but you're going to have at least inflammation um, to to significant swelling and um, cellular death, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, John was asking, what is the habitat range of the black I've heard that it is not prevalent Western states. So did you say brown recluse? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll have to refresh myself on that. I did not kind of um, look up the the geography on that. So I, I probably need to put that as a to-do as well so we can get back to him. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Um, Darlene was telling us about the backpack. Um, let's see. Garrett was asking, can you suck the venom out after being bitten by a snake or spider? I think we talked about that as well. We didn't mention that for spider, but but you you agree that that's not yes. mm -hmm. you don't want to that for spider either correct correct right. yeah um let's see you had some other baby rattlers um and then brian was asking about he spends a lot of time in the woods hiking none of the unusual steps um that don't apply but was asking what do you do when you can't wash the area you can't immobilize it you can't elevate it um, and you can't get to attention quickly, and you don't have cell service, and you're miles away from any road to be able to get to an ambulance. Um, so See, talk about wilderness medicine. That's real wilderness yeah. medicine for sure. Yeah. So um, going back to kind of first principles, you know, if you if you don't have soap, just just actually using water will at least be some degree of efficacy versus doing nothing. Um, if you don't have a first aid kit, um, I, I think essentially he was, that person was asking if you can't do any of the kind of conservative uh, measures before you're getting treatment. Um, you, you know, so instead of washing, you would just use water um, you want to stay calm the whole time, which I know is always challenging. Um, but, you know, immobilizing, you don't need to have um, a specific, like, a splint made. Um, if it is, uh, you, you can always make a makeshift splint from, like, your shirt, things like that, if you have multiple, um, you know, pieces of clothing. Um, it, it, you know, I think it's very situational, right? Like, if if you're kind of, it almost feels like the person is, I know we have these game shows where the person's kind of just left in the middle of nowhere and they have to survive with, with basically nothing. But um, I'm trying to think what were the last couple of questions. Um, if you can't actually get out, is that correct? Right. Um, yeah. If you have no, yeah, that's tough, right? Like if, if, if this person is actually kind of doing these extreme events kind of solo, like, you do put yourself at pretty good risk. Um, and I know people do it. It's become much more common with extreme like marathons, hundred mile runs. And, you know, you, David Goggins is a famous Navy SEAL that does these extreme things. But um, I would just try to keep the tenets of what you should be able to do. And I think for this case, you actually, if you're going to be somewhere that is high risk for snakes, um, maybe even do your own research about the self-administered snake kit, you know, um, I know certain parts of Africa and the and in the Middle East with the neurotoxic snakes, it is a whole different story about about snake bite um, kits that are available. So, um, fortunately, in the U.S., things are much milder in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Gary was asking. We haven't talked about this one as well. If you've been bit by a snake before, can you not take the antivenom again a second time? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question because you do see snake handlers that deal with the neurotoxic, the really dangerous snakes. And because they've been bitten over time, they, in some ways, they do have an immunity. Um, but I think for, for this audience and those who aren't professional snake handlers, like I, I think it, it's a very nuanced decision. It, the timing of when your last anti-venom was, I, I do think there is 
uh, kind of this time course that you do have to wait wait out. And so um, I think it's very specific to the the previous antivenom that you took and then the risk of the snake bite you got now and the location and things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, we'll take one last question because I think it's really important um, and then we'll wrap up because I know we're right here at the end. But Ernie was asking, um, Ernie was asking, when you get to the ER um, and you're not in an ambulance, how do you get immediate treatment instead of having to sit in a line? So the, um, the, the front desk and the, the triage person, they are trained to take um, certain conditions ahead of the line. And I'll just leave it at that unless Holly, you want to share more, but I don't want to give away the, the, the secrets of ER triage, but um, they definitely prioritize some things over others. I would just make for sure that you were very clear. Yeah. Bit by spike and, and show them, you know, make for sure that triage nurse, even if they're full in which most ERs are, we can always find a place for you. Usually in the, we might have to put you in the hallway on a stretcher, but we can always find a place um, to at least get you, get you mm -hmm. seen immediately if that's, if that's an emergency that has occurred. So yeah, guys, these are excellent. Questions. Yeah, excellent questions. We haven't gotten to all of them. We will follow up with you. Maybe we'll put something on the calendar to, to revisit this again because it's obviously a, a subject that many have questions about. Um, it, again, we've had the heat, lots of heat injuries lately. If you need information or resources for that guide, you're welcome to download that. It's there in the resource section. Dr. Sherry, I appreciate you participating and I appreciate all of you guys um, joining in as well. And I, I we We've had so many questions. I think I'm going to have to go through them and give out maybe several different prizes today. So you may get a love note from me afterwards um, asking for your address, and I'll put something in the, in the mail to you. So thank you again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.